EX Deviants. There's 18 of them. These monstrosities of game design are loaded up on fat health pools and souped up moves that can one-shot you. And I'm gonna kill them all. The elite players of Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate, the ones who beat all 18 EX Deviants, are easily identified by a large crown symbol next to their name. And I want that crown. Join me, Grifted, as we brave our way through Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate toughest challenges. Tag along as I attempt to join the ranks of the Royal Elite and wear those sweet crowns. This is the Royal Road. Hello, my name is Grifted and welcome back to my late game let's play of Monster Hunter Generations Ultimate. Before we get into the video, let's take a look back at the previous episode to see what we accomplished. And basically all I did was Dead Eye Garuga. Of course that means that 3 out of the 18 EX Deviants are done. Now, let's jump into this episode's to-do list. So I really want to keep farming up these Deviants. I feel like I'm lacking in Deviant levels, so that will be a big focus for this episode. Next I'd like to do the Old Fatalis event quest for the gear. I have some new sets I really want to make. Which brings me to the next objective, make some new sets. I want to do a support hunting horn build, specifically for some of the EX Deviants that have really brutal status afflictions. Another build I'd like to do is a horn maestro build, and eventually a flying pub skill build, because often I find myself having trouble with song maintenance during long fights. And finally I'd like to take on another EX Deviant. Oh, I made this handy chart so we can see where all my deviant levels currently are. And with this quick guild card check, let's start the video. I was watching Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. It's a, it's a little talk show that's hosted by Jerry Seinfeld, a very famous comedian. And the guest he had was Dave Chappelle. And it was a really interesting episode, but there was this one moment in particular that really resonated with me. And uh, b basically... Jerry Seinfeld was saying how good of a compliment taker Dave Chappelle is, uh, essentially saying that he's incredibly humble. And Dave Chappelle, in more or less words, sort of answered the question or responded to that with saying that he's a very shy person and being in the spotlight and being complimented makes him feel really uncomfortable and he's very socially awkward. He also goes on to say later on in the episode that because he's so shy, he's so introverted as, as a real person, that it allows for the person who is on stage to exist. And I thought that was incredible. And it sort of had me being more contemplative and looking at myself and my own ego. Nobody wants to be the guy who, when they get a compliment, is like, yeah, of course, you know, no one wants to be that guy who, who doesn't take compliments well, right? But I am that guy, and I've been that guy for a long time, and I was sort of wondering why. Um, and I'm in this fragile state where I'm almost 30, and I have a child coming uh, next year in April, and I'm sort of looking at myself and, and examining what kind of man I am and what kind of man I want to be for my child and my wife. So I have, a, I have a pretty big ego, and I was looking back on my life and, and you know wondering how I got there, how I got a big ego, how it's helped me, and how it's hurt me. And I think, I think a big core problem of this was I was raised very poor. My, both my parents were incredibly hard workers, but because of their own individual vices, we were always hurting for money. Ego or humility were not traits that were inherently taught to us, uh, my sister and I, when we were kids. My parents were very much blue collar people and my father specifically was a provider, okay? He's an army vet and he worked in a warehouse while going to school to get his nursing degree. And then he became an ER nurse, a trauma nurse. And my father's always been a provider. And the traits of ego and the trait of humility are not present in that role. There's no room for humility. There is no room for ego. There is only providing for your family. And I learned that from him. The primary things that my father taught me were pride, integrity, and work ethic. These were the core traits that he displayed and they were the traits that he seemed to value the most in other men. 
and you know me being a kid watching that that's you know I, you, I wanted to emulate my father so work ethic integrity and pride all became the primary attributes that I was chasing as I went through you know my teenage years and and my adulthood humility and ego were never were never you know conscious thoughts in my head at all as I became a man and joined the military that's really when my ego started to become noticeable. I worked in labor and delivery while I was overseas in Japan. If you've never worked in the medical field, th this might not make any sense to you, but it's an incredibly egotistical field. It's there's there's a lot of alphas, okay, from from doctors to nurses to med techs, okay? What I didn't know as a kid and what I know now having worked in the medical field is that there is always ego in the medical field, no matter what, okay? When it, it your ego fuels your confidence and your confidence allows you to perform at extremely high levels under very intense situations. As a corpsman on labor and delivery, we were in charge of neonatal resuscitation and, and that basically means CPR on babies, okay? Bringing babies back to life or, or not. And if you... Uh, if, you're, if you had bad hands, if you had weak hands and you couldn't perform, your hands were shaking, you couldn't perform the, the, the appropriate levels of chest compressions, you couldn't, um, you know, you, you can't do what's required of you, you know, I would lambast you. I, I, I would take you off my team. You wouldn't touch a patient. It's sort of, it, it, you know, the military is this perfect breeding ground for ego because it can just go completely unchecked and moreover, you can be rewarded for having an ego. When I got to labor and delivery, I was an E1. That's the lowest ranking military personnel that you could be, okay? And because I demonstrated my value and my skill and I took my job very seriously and I pursued my education while I was there, I became a subject matter expert in neonatal resuscitation. I became a team leader of other corpsmen who were higher ranking than me all the way up to an E4. Usually in the military, it's like whoever is the higher ranking is automatically put into a leadership position. Well, this wasn't the case for me. I was put into a leadership position because I was good and I was vocal about being good, about being the best corpsman. And it wasn't for self-validation reasons. It wasn't for, you know, the respect and admiration of my coworkers. What what it really was for is because you become a target, right? You you create this level of scrutiny in your life where if you are saying you're the best, if you're saying you're so good at whatever it is, people are going to look at you to fail. And I loved that feeling. I loved people looking at me and wanting me to fail because all it did was push me further and made me more successful. I love being able to say something and then display it, right? I can back up everything I say because it's on display. Look at my skill. Look how good I am. Look, challenge me. Challenge my knowledge. Challenge my skill. I was obsessed with that feeling. I loved it. I was intoxicated by that feeling. I don't think that's inherently ego, but it definitely presented to my coworkers as ego, and I definitely developed a reputation of ha having an ego. And this carried on for the rest of my military career. As I was stationed with the Marines, I had even more corpsmen working under me. I had 12 corpsmen working under me at one point, and I was a bastard. I really was. And if you, if you weren't like me, and you couldn't perform and you couldn't back up what you say I would roast you I would get you out of my I would get you out of my battalion aid station you would not touch patients you would not be around marines you would not lay hands on any patients because I can't trust you I needed my corpsman to be as egotistical as I was confident aggressive a type personalities and I look back and I I kind of created a team of monsters <laughs> And, and I, you know, I might be exaggerating it, but really, I mean, we were, uh, and you had to be, you, you really had to be in these environments and these environments that I was in really created this, um, I don't know, unpleasant person and who I was at work started to bleed over into my personal life. <laughs> I was a douchebag, to be honest, to females, to, you know, my friends sometimes it led to a lot of it, it led to a lot of problems, um, getting in the, in the <laughs> getting in the fights and getting into trouble in the Navy and all kinds of all kinds of stuff. 
So anyway, I get out of the military uh, at the beginning of 2018. It was completely different. Um, nobody cares. Nobody cares about you in the civilian world, right? It's it's nobody cares about your accomplishments. No one no one cares about the 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 death you've seen. No one cares about the lives you've saved. No one cares about any anything you've done in the military ego kind of became not that important uh, my wife and i have been together for two have been married for two years and she's done a lot of work on me she's really softened my edges and kind of toned me down a little bit because when i came out of the military i came out really hot i came out guns hot dude i was kind of unpleasant you know i was kind of unpleasant and my wife really toned that down being a speedrunner, being a content creator, I definitely have an ego. I am not without fault. I am not without sin. I have an ego. I love making something or producing something, whether it be a speedrun or a piece of content that it, you know, it gets a lot of praise. I love that feeling, and I, you know, I catch myself being like, of course, of course, uh, Masterclass has a hundred thousand views. It, it, why wouldn't it? It's the best piece of content that Monster Hunter's ever seen, you know? And it's really ugly and it's really unpleasant. And I don't I don't want to be that person. But the thing that really kicked it over the edge is is my new job. I got a new job this year in uh, at the beginning of June and I work with um, in a, individuals with intellectual disabilities, basically special needs. When I pull up to his house to pick him up, he's waiting at the door for me. And then he hugs me and he's he's so so thankful so glad to see me and this is a love that is completely untouched by personal bias or or your environment this is a kid who doesn't care about your religion your race your weight your level of athleticism what you've done in your life or what your plans are he just loves you for for who you are and that's it and i've never seen that before and Nobody wants to be the guy who takes compliments poorly, and I am that guy, but I don't want to be that guy. And I thought this was a fitting end to the video because I didn't beat Malfestio. I lost. I triple carded, actually. But sometimes... I don't know. Sometimes failure is a good thing. Hey, thanks for watching. And... As always, keep playing that sweet chin music, boys.